Hey, it's Sarah Burke here from the Women in Media podcast. And before we get started on a new episode, could I get you to hit like, follow, subscribe, hit the bell, whichever app you do your podcast listening in. Make sure you're all set up so you know when there's a new episode and you can help spread the word. Oh, and if you're so inclined, could I ask you to leave a review if the app that you're using does that? You're the best. All right, let's get to the show. I'm Sarah Burke, and this is the Women in Media podcast. Often you recognize the names of the guests that I have on the show. And although her name may be a little more behind the scenes, I'm certain you know her work. My guest today is a producer, songwriter, composer, mixer, recording engineer, and multi-instrumentalist. And this year, she made Canadian music history when she became the first woman to be nominated for and win a Juno for Recording Engineer of the Year. It's still so crazy to me. I feel very proud. People resonated with those records because the challenge is in doing something like this during a pandemic is that you're not in the space with somebody. So you've eliminated that initial visceral thing of having a certain energy in a room. I believe that even before you start pressing record on something, you need to forge a relationship and build a trust and a bond with the people that you're working with because you're not going to get anything real if you haven't established the foundation. People aren't gonna take risks and open up and be vulnerable in front of you if they don't feel safe doing that. Hill Krakutis, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm fantastic, how are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. And how'd I do with the pronunciation of your name, which I was so nervous about on the Juno's red carpet? Everybody gets so freaked out about it. It's (laughs) it's phonetic. Krakutis, it's done. Your background is Greek, Greek, right? That's correct. So um, I, I've wanted to talk to you for a while. Funny enough, we have um, like a childhood friend in common, but also, I mean, you just made Juno history and you made Women in Media podcast history. I've never had anyone on the like mixing, recording, engineering end on the podcast. There's not a lot of women in the field. <laughs> not a ton, but it is growing. What made you want to do this for a living? Like what were those first, uh, you know, sort of flags when you were young that I got to be in music? <laughs> well, the I think um, the first thing that I can remember is seeing like a Greek band playing at a at a cultural event and me wanting to be on stage. And I'm like, oh, I like that thing that that guy's playing. And it was a guitar. And so I knew I wanted to get um, into playing guitar first. And funnily enough, the first guitar I ever received was from Olivia's father. Um, this is our childhood friend. Yes, for this is our childhood friend for context. Sorry. <laughs> I just assumed everybody <laughs> knows everything. Um, yeah. And then from there, I just realized that I started hearing arrangements and things in my head. And I didn't actually know that there was like a job associated with actually facilitating the making of recordings. Um, but then after reading liner notes and stuff, I started to realize all the people involved in making records. And that's when I think I first realized that, oh, maybe that's something that I could actually do as a job. Um, So yeah, and it was, that was pretty much it from there. Who's the first musician that you remember, like, picking apart an arrangement? Uh, I think I always naturally picked apart arrangements. But I think what the the musician that truly inspired me, I think, on many levels um, was Sheryl Crow because just reading her liner notes, seeing that she, like, produced her own records, she wrote her songs, she um, played a bunch of instruments, she sang. Like, I just think I was really intrigued by the fact that she just did a bit of everything. Um, mm. And so I remember really diving into her records and I always found her arrangements on her and her production just in general to be very unique. Like those first three records were pretty life changing for me. So is there a point you remember realizing it could be a job? Um, I think it was just always something I knew I wanted to do. It was weird. Like I could distinctly remember. I don't know if I was two. I just remember seeing musicians and being like, oh, I'm totally going to do that when I grow up. And that was there was never really a a plan B for me. Like I had other interests. I had interests in archaeology, in architecture, in medicine, <laughs> and all so these things. Random. But I didn't but I didn't necessarily want to um, go to school for those things. I, I didn't necessarily see myself studying for those things. So I think every thing that I chose to do was kind of connected to music in some way. Okay. And 
how did you get into it? What was the, the first gig or volunteer opportunity or shadow someone else who was doing it, mentorship situation? As a musician or as a as a as a recording engineer slash producer? I guess, <laughs> I guess we should moments. say which came first. <laughs> okay, yeah, so musician we should go came which first. came first. The musician thing okay. came first. And I, I was um twelve years old and I was going to an all girls school, we were in grade seven, and it was in homeroom. And I was playing guitar for a few years and I always knew I wanted to start a band. And then um, I like came across the Go-Go's vinyl and my mom's vinyl collection. And I was like, holy shit, these are like women that are playing all the instruments in this band. And and then the light bulb went off like, oh, wait, this is totally possible. Mm -hmm. And so I was in homeroom and I started to get really excited. And I just started asking my friends that I knew like were either getting into guitar or like there was one friend that had just started playing the drums and I'm like, we should like, totally I need just start a band. Yeah, I'm like, we're totally starting a band right now. And Megan Patrick was actually in my grade, and, and so she was our lead singer. And then oh my God, I, I was like the guitar player, and then our friend Chris Matheson, she was like the bass player, and then my friend Natalie was the drummer. And that's how the, the first band started. So this is small town Ontario? Where did, where did you grow this up? Is, this is Whitby, Ontario. I grew up in a small hamlet called Greenwood, which was uh, just north of Ajax and Pickering. And yeah, so that's how the first band started. And then from there, it was like this very serious thing. I knew I wanted to start gigging right away. So we would practice in our parents' living rooms and basements. And our school actually gave us like a practice space too in the bird tower, which was like oh, love that. in the attic of the school, which was really fun. And yeah, and then from there, eventually like we made a demo. I got it sent out um, – to some labels and they thought like it was the silliest little demo (laughs) where we all sound like little chipmunks because we were so young. (laughs) Um, But for some reason, some of the people, like we said, this little book that had our bio and like the history of the band, even though we'd only been together for six months, but we're determined. You knew uh, to have a bio and a demo? Like this is Oh, we had a book. We had a book. Like I still have this book. I will show it to you one day. It was really hilarious. Um, yeah, and we had all our lyrics in there. We're like, look how serious we are. We're giving you our song lyrics that we wrote like at the age of 12. And yeah, anyway, long story short, ended up getting a manager that worked at a label from there. And yeah, started gigging the clubs like within a year in Toronto from there. And then that opened the up everything gig. else. Holy Joes. Um, I was 13. I played acoustically. That was like my first, well, that was the first like gig in Toronto. My, our first gig as a band was at the arts night. Like there we put on, we had this thing called house plays. So all the houses like Harry Potter styles did these little short plays and we competed against each other. And so we played at the intermission so of house plays. Yeah. Very And that cool. was the first okay. official siren. We were called the sirens. That was like our first gig. <laughs> amazing the but sirens, not not police it. sirens like the sirens like the greek mythological creature sirens okay that's that's good to point out as well okay we felt deep i'm trying to picture you as like a you know preteen, and i imagine that in that band you were the person with like all the pedals and the knobs and all the things and you were the person who definitely recorded that demo aren't you well, actually, what what inspired me to start recording myself is that we got in touch with, um, I used to just email all my favorite artists when I first started because I wanted to like know how to get into the industry and I had no qualms about anything. So I reached out to a bunch of bands and then a bunch of them wrote back and um, Andrew Franey, who was in the band Smoother, which I used to love, he wrote back and he was like, oh, you're in a band? Cool. And he's like, can I call you one day and like listen to you guys rehearse? So he called us one day on our parents' landline. And then he's like, hey, do you, like, you guys totally need a demo. Do you want me to record the demo? And he's the one that actually started sending it out to the label- labels for us. So yeah, he was and he brought over he was a do it yourself kind of guy. So he brought over his PC. It was not even a laptop. It was like literally the tower. He brought over the full <laughs> He brought over the whole computer with a monitor with the drummer from Smoother Adam and he recorded us in my parents' basement and then produced this demo. And it was like he also did programming on it. Like it was the first time that I'd seen someone do programming too. And that wow. is what inspired me. So I actually started off using Cool Edit Pro, which was like the first program that we used to, to make that. I had that Andrew's program. like, you got to get Cool Edit Pro. 
And I also got like a really early version of Fruity Loops. And it was like the first wave of bedroom producing. Like you actually take your PC and you take it around and you produce records in basements and bedrooms. And it was like really fun. Um, So yeah, that's how the demo was first made. And then after that experience within those few years after that is when I was like, hey, I'm going to get a laptop and I'm going to put all this stuff on my laptop and start making my own demos. So at this point in The Sirens, um, did you know that there was something about you that was like, well, I kind of want it to sound like this. Like, why don't we try it this way and like playing around with different sounds in the programming? For sure. I was a bit of a bossy pants, like looking back. And this is what I'm getting But it's because yeah. I knew what I wanted, right? Like I would be the person that's like, yo guys, like if you want to make it, we got to practice. We got to like put in the time. And everyone's like, but I just want to go with my friends and go to the movies. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Are you even serious right now? So yeah, I was a bit, I knew that I was a bit extra, um, (laughs) but I knew that this is what I wanted to do. So I think I, I knew that I wanted to spend as much time as possible. Plus it wasn't even just that. It wasn't even just about attaining the goal. It's like, I just really enjoyed learning all this stuff. And my obsession, yes, started with guitars and pedals. And so I started off with like one pedal that was a multi-purpose like Digitech pedal. And then it ended up, once I started to see what my other favorite artists were using, like Kurt Cobain, you know, and and the Go-Go's, like I was like looking at all their rigs because there used to be a website. I can't even remember. I don't even know if it still exists, but you can actually look up like all these artists' rigs and what they use. So then I started to dissect that and I'm like, what pedal are they using for this sound and that and that? So I started to amass, you know, this collection of pedals and slowly just started acquiring instruments because I started off on guitar um, slash piano, but then I was like, wait, well, if I'm going to make my own demos, I got to learn how to play all this stuff. So uh, then I picked up the bass because I'm like, how hard can that be? It's like, it's like a guitar, but with just four strings playing root notes, like can't be that hard. Even though it's a little more than that now, but that was just the mentality at the time. And then also drumming. I, I really wanted to get into drums as well. So then that's when I asked for a drum kit for Christmas. I got like this really crappy CB drums, like drum kit. And, um, I started to teach myself how to play drums to like Nirvana records because Dave Grohl was God. And then then it was trial and error. Like I was just throwing up my rehearsal mics like they were like SM58s and I just started capturing the sounds and Cool Edit Pro and then figuring out how to make things work. What's the, the first time that you remember someone else trusting you with their art? Okay, I remember exactly when this happened because up until that point, it was just me and I was still pretty bad at doing it. By this point, I had graduated from Cool Edit Pro. I went to Long and McQuaid during one of their like huge sales and I purchased a used Digio 2 Pro Tools rig. Um, and by that point, I started collecting the odd mic here and there. I, um, you know, I was getting a little more into it. I was starting to get into plugins that weren't just stock plugins. Um, still making my own demos. And by this point I started to actually make my own recordings because I felt that in studio environments, working with other producers and engineers, while I, I, I really appreciated those experiences and I still appreciate those experiences because I learned so much from working with other people and seeing what they do and how they're interpreting the workflow. Um, I just didn't have the budget to always go into studios and I wasn't always getting what I was hearing in my head from other people trying to articulate that. So I was like, okay, I got, I really got to learn how to do this on my own. Um, and so, yeah. And then I started to do that more and more. And then my friend Graf, who's like this incredible artist and I was totally obsessed with her music too. Um, she said she wanted to work on a kind of more rootsy alternative project. And she's like, Hey, do you want to come over and just like, we'll start making tracks together. And that was the first time someone else had asked uh, me to start working on their stuff. And I loved it. I loved that I could still do the creative process without necessarily having to be the artist that goes out there to promote it. So, Yeah, because I, I always wonder about this type of stuff, like how, you know, someone that's so close to the way that they do their own art, how they might do when someone else is like, no, 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 I don't like it like that, you know? Um, so that, yeah, that's really interesting to me. Did you have any reservations about doing this as a woman? I never thought about it, to be honest. Like I, I've never even thought of, for the most part, my entire life, I never thought that my hindrance was being a woman. I became aware of certain like weird, I don't know whether you want to call them microaggressions or whatever, just these passive aggressive weird situations that would occur 
but I didn't even become aware of them until people started talking about it. It was like just something that was there, but yeah. it didn't really get in the way of things. Um, but, but yeah, like I think the biggest thing that I, I encountered to be honest, I think was just being a really young person in these spaces and being taken seriously. That's what I thought my hindrance was at first. Um, yeah. but for me, it was mainly just about, you know, I have this, passion for something and it makes me really happy and I just my main concern was finding a way to make a living at it you know without having to work a day job Mm -hmm. and so was there a point where you were working like both in the industry and out of the industry not really I had a few stints where like when I was in university just to make some extra cash on the side I um, got a job as an executive assistant at a music video production company called The Field. And I was already in film school at that point. So it just felt like a natural fit for me to learn a bit more about the production side of making things, of making films rather. Um, And then, so yeah, I I would do that job a couple times a week to make some extra cash. And it was actually out of that opportunity that um, when Serena uh, Ryder had asked me to to direct one of her music videos, I was like in my second year of film school. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm still a student. Why do you want me to direct your music video? <laughs> she says, just write a treatment. And if we like it, like we want you to do it. So I did that. And then um, I went to the executive producer whose assistant I was and was like, okay, so I wrote this treatment and now they want me to do the video. And I'm like, I don't know what to do. And she's like, well, obviously we're producing the video for you. And I was like, okay. And then that turned into me then being represented by them as a director and and making videos. Okay. So that was like another job I had. Um, And then for one Christmas in my first year university, I worked at Bang On T-shirts like on Queen Street during the month of December so that I could buy my family gifts for Christmas. But that's the only other job I've had outside of entertainment oh and I worked I worked with my parents sorry I worked at my parents office in the summers growing up because that's how I bought my gear I used to um do filing and answering phones in the summers for their company oh yeah try doing that for a window business it's real thrilling thanks well I I did that for (laughs) I did that for a clean yeah my my family was in the cleaning business so we totally did that it was awesome yeah yeah my dad was like thinking about retirement a few years ago and and like as we were talking about it I'm just like I really hope that there's no like family guilt here about keeping the business alive because I just don't think I could go into <laughs> windows <laughs> I, I'm the black sheep of my family too anyway. I, I I'm the only one not in the family business so so okay Fil- film you went to film school I didn't know yeah. that so that's really interesting too because like I guess you obviously loved like messing around with the production of things visually as well as audio Okay, so tell me about yourself in this environment where the Serena Ryder moment happens. Did you find yourself feeling confident enough to do that at that point? Well, I'll tell you a little secret. (laughs) It's not a secret. So every time that I'm asked to do something I've never done before, actually, anytime I'm asked to do anything in general, I always think I'm going to screw it up. Like, I'm terrified, to be honest. And so in this instance, it pretty much mirrors everything that I feel all the time, but when they said yes, no, for real, like we we want you to do this, I pretty much didn't sleep for weeks after that. Like I was like, oh crap, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't like I have imposter syndrome constantly. Um, Everyone even on this podcast now, does. Even now, like I still have it all the time. Someone calls me up and I'm like, oh shit, this is like this is not good. I'm not. I'm gonna mess this up. But I think that's <laughs> the motivation for trying to find a way to succeed and find my way through it because like failure is not an option. Like letting people down is not an option. So while I'm freaking out on the inside, on the outside, I'm like, yeah, you know what? We're going to slay this. And it's kind of a fake it till you make it kind of a thing. (laughs) And it's like a sink or swim thing. And I totally need to just figure out how to swim in every situation. And that's not to say I don't make mistakes. That's not to say that um, I don't have to sometimes research things in order to really become confident with something that I'm about to do. Um, But yeah, I don't know. The whole thing is like just finding your way through it. So fun, though. I love that. Uh, What's your hardest moment been in the business so far? Maybe a time where you almost didn't swim? I'd have to say the the biggest thing that's gotten in my way, I think, is myself. I think like it's because when it comes to technical things, 
I mean, sometimes mistakes, quote unquote mistakes, will lead to these really amazing breakthroughs creatively. I don't think there's really making mistakes in in the creative sense. Um, there's just the journey of trial and error and trying to figure out what's working and what's not. Um, but for me, I think it, it, it's been easy because I get in my head so much about things. I There's a fine line between psyching yourself out and like getting into that really paralyzed state versus trying to push through that extreme discomfort and anxiety um, in order to just like put yourself out there and move through the experience. So I think that's been the biggest struggle that I've had. There hasn't necessarily been a moment that um, resulted in a scary situation. Because as I said, that's never been an option for me. It's like there, there might be a roller coaster type of experience where I doubt myself along the way or something's just not working and we have to figure it out. But a lot of the things that I do creatively are all about just problem solving and finding what, what's working and what's not. And then you just yeah. kind of have to move through it until you land on something. But I think like as long as you're listening to the people that you're collaborating with, you can't really screw something up, you know, because then it just becomes about the experience and the journey you're taking together rather than me. It weighing completely on me, you know? Right, right. Um, With all the names that I'm seeing, like of who you've worked with, right? So you've got everyone from, you know, Digging Roots and Leela Gilday, Serena Ryder, um, Posey, Megan Patrick. Um, What's like one of the biggest lessons that you've learned from someone that you've worked with? Um, I think one of the biggest things that I've learned and have really had to learn to accept and not resist is to trust the process because I can be a bit of a control freak, you know, like I want to anticipate every single thing that could possibly arise. And sometimes, I mean, it's not sometimes, it's all the time in the case of being creative, you can't really dictate how things happen. You're you're always going to have to find your way through the process. Um, So learning to trust that, learning to trust that you're not always going to meet a timeline with some things because with something as abstract as art, that is a living, breathing thing on its own that you're kind of building up along the way. Sometimes it needs to sit. Sometimes it needs a moment to realize itself. And I think not getting in the way of that and not trying to steer that direction into a place it's not meant to go has been the greatest experience and that became really apparent too with the digging roots record that we made because that record was a couple years in the making right like we no initially thought it was going to take a couple of months um and it's just that that record needed to go on this journey and just learning to just kind of sit back and allow that journey to happen was one of the most beautiful things um and we got such an amazing piece of art out of it and such amazing storytelling out of it so it was really a testament to to that thing that I have been slowly learning throughout this whole process as a producer is just trust the path that the art needs to take don't get in the way of it just like Mm -hmm. observe it enough to be able to facilitate the process because that's what my job is ultimately is to be a facilitator and listen to what the artist's needs are and then find a way to reconcile all those things So risk taking is like a really fun part of this type of job as well. And like trying new things, Um, which is funny because I'm not normally a risk taker. Like I'm not (laughs) one of those people that likes to gamble. But um, yeah, I guess totally within the context of music, it's all about risk. It's all about trying things. Get right into like something technical. If it's like, oh, we normally I normally set up things like this. And this one time someone suggested that we try it this way and it ended up being really cool. Uh, for, okay, first thing that comes to mind was I was working with an acapella group called A440. And it was the first time I had to record a beatboxer. And I was like freaking out because I'd never made a record without instruments. I was like, how do you do this? How do you take something? I mean, a voice obviously can be very dynamic and diverse. Um, but the interesting thing about working with an acapella group and when you actually think that, oh, I'm just working with voices, it's like, how do I fill the spectrum that normally as a producer I would fill with any instrument that I could go out and choose? Like, the whole thing is we cannot use any other instruments but a voice on this. Um, So, I mean, I get there, and the first thing is recording the beatboxer, and, and the beatboxer 
kind of just sits there and well they don't just sit there it's actually something I could never freaking do I'm kind of in awe by beatboxing but generally you're going there and, and you're just recording whatever their mouth is doing whatever beat they're playing and so I put up this really fancy condenser mic and we're getting the beatboxer to his name's Luke we're getting him to perform and it just like for some reason was feeling flat and yet he's such an energetic performer and I was trying to figure out why we weren't capturing that feeling. Um, so I just went out of where I was on the computer and I came into the space that he was recording in and I was like, can you just like in the air do your thing for a second? I just like need to watch you for a minute. And he was moving around like and I realized that a big part of his performance and the feeling was coming from the fact that he actually uses his body to emote to evoke Uh, so I was like okay I can't have you standing there awkwardly in front of a mic on a stand like that's just not gonna work and also how am I going to get the depth of the sound that he was producing because like there was a lot happening I started to move around him and like move my ear around his like neck and stuff and like wow there's like a lot of sound even just coming out of his neck like so (laughs) so then I was like okay well we have to just do something that I, I I need to mic him like a drum kit I need to get like more than one mic on him I think if I'm going to capture the depth of what I'm hearing in this recording. So I went to Long McQuaid because it was around the corner from my studio and I got a lav mic and I I found some duct tape and then I'm like, okay, if he needs to move around, then he's going to have a handheld mic, but it needs to be a condenser just so I could get that sound that I wanted. And I happened to have a condenser mic that was handheld, a Sennheiser. And so then we came back and I'm like, okay. And then I put up some room mics just to get that depth feeling. And then I'm like, okay, I have some mics here. And then I like duct tape this lav mic on his neck and I'm like, okay, let's try this again. (laughs) And so we start doing this again and I'm like, okay, this is much better. I'm getting the energy now, but I'm getting all this like sound from his neck stubble, like from his beard. And I'm like, (laughs) shit, dude. I'm like, we're going to have to. And then I was hearing, you know, his hand rubbing against the condenser mic. I'm like, this is not going to work. So then I'm like, wait a minute, we need to go to shoppers. And so then we went around the corner of shoppers drug mart and I got like a sponge and I got um, a razor And so I'm like, sorry, dude, but in the name of your art, we're going to just have to shave a little patch where we're going to put this mic so I don't get the beard stubble sound against the lab. And then I duct taped like the sponge around the handheld mic. And then so that solved the problem that we were getting of it, you know, his hand movements. And then we got rid of the stubble sound. Yeah. And then and then that's so that's what I kind of realized in that moment, too. It's like and I never went to engineer school, so I never necessarily had that thing in my mind of oh there's a proper way to do things it's always been a trial and error process for me it's always Um, a trip to shoppers drug mart (laughs) yeah you you pretty much just got to do what the song and the art is calling for or what the what the artist or musician needs in order to have the best set of circumstances where they could fully get into something and not be too cerebral about it right and And so that's always the balance is just like finding some ways to do that. And so even on the technical side, you have to get creative sometimes because yes, there are certain status quos that you can refer to for this is the type of vocal that I want to get, or this is the type of drum sound I want to get. And I have to be in this room and I have to put it through this gear, whatever that is, you know, but um, for the most part, you just essentially have to kind of be in the moment and, and use your intuition with a lot of things and try things and see what's working and what's not working. Um, yeah. So anyway, that's how we ended up doing that record. And we we got the main loop. And then I realized, okay, if I want to make this interesting in a mix, and if I want to make this sound like a pop record, and not something that's very thin, because I'm only using like a live set of these individual voices that I'm recording, I applied the concept of overdubs, you know, when I'm working on other types of music. Um, And so I got the beatboxer to then just give me a bunch of samples, essentially, like, here's a snare sound and give me a bunch of kick sounds, different timbres of things. And so I was able to then go in and actually program his individual hits on the loops that he was giving me. Um, And then I was able to actually control individual levels of things and really shape the sound further using only voices, which was really fun. It's like, uh, to me, production is like the Lego, playing with Lego of the music industry. It really is. So fun. And I loved Lego as a kid. So maybe, I don't know if there's like a, a correlation between that 
trait. So funny. So, I mean, you just, I saw on, on your socials, like you were just doing a songwriting camp of some sort. So tell me a little bit about like the songwriting part of you and also mentorship, because it seems like, you know, you've had a lot of mentorship in the past, but now you're in that mentorship role for other people. For sure. Um, so on the songwriting front, um, yeah, I don't know. I've always been a songwriter. Like ever since the sirens, I was kind of the primary songwriter of that band. And it's always been the vehicle that I've used first and foremost, just to express things that I was going through that I couldn't always articulate in words or communications with people. It was how I processed my life. Um, and then similar to the production thing, you know, I eventually got asked to start, uh, writing for other people based on the songs that I was writing for myself. And then I learned through co-writing the magic of collaboration as a writer. And that really helped me grow as a writer as well. Um, yeah, now I just, you know, as much as I can just try to write with artists all over the place. And I also do these writing camps every so often when they're put on, which are really fun because for about three or four days, you get to go in these spaces with other writers, top liners, artists, um, and producers and just write some, some writing camps have specific purposes. So you're writing for specific things. Other times it's, we're just looking for awesome songs. Um, and I find that when we're in these creative environments where we're all there with the same common goal, there's just this beautiful openness that can occur. And I think you can get some really interesting stuff out of those types of environments. So I try to do those as much as I can. So who was putting on the one that you just did? Uh, High Priestess Publishing. It's a a publishing company that's owned by Kim Temple, who's an incredible woman. Um, And yeah, we were actually writing for some of um, their artists. But there was also other artists that weren't signed to High Priestess that were um, involved in the camp as well. So yeah, it's just a really great way to collaborate with people and meet new people that you wouldn't normally collaborate with. Um, And yeah, and, and it's great. Like actually a lot of the artists that I work with came out of things like writing camps or writing sessions where we just formed this really amazing relationship. We saw that we worked together and collaborated well together as songwriters and that just organically grew into this um recording relationship after that very cool i was seeing your stuff on sky wallace's uh, feed and i was like yeah so oh i was writing God. with sky and it was cool because sky and i have been talking for a while but we actually haven't worked together yet and so ah. it was just a really great opportunity for us to write an awesome like rock and roll banger and yeah i just had so much fun we actually wrote the song in under 30 minutes and then we were in revolution recording which is like a gorgeous studio and they had like already had a drum kit mic'd up. So the next thing you know, we started making records. We were like recording the drums through the beautiful Neve console. And usually you don't get that luxury in a writing camp because you have to pretty much write and produce a song by the end of the day. So you're not, it's not, you're not in the business of making records normally where you're like, okay, I'm going to set up all the live stuff and actually record it. Um, but yeah, I mean, the song wrote itself. So here we were making records, having fun in this gorgeous studio. Yeah. That's so fun. So what what's on the like recording or work with a certain artist collaborative bucket list? Like what are you trying to manifest? What's next? Bucket list. Okay. Well, I'm a dreamer, so I have some crazy dreams. Let's hear it. I don't know. I, I for me, I just really am attracted to projects with artists that have something to say and want to do something a bit different. And so there's artists like you know, St. Vincent or Brandy Carlisle that are pushing boundaries. And those are the types of projects I think that I, I see myself doing and would like to see myself doing. Um, and I'm sure there's a ton of artists out there that I just haven't named or that I haven't even come into knowing yet. Um, but I do know that that's the type of work that I always, that I am doing now and would like to continue doing. Um, yeah, I'm not, I, I really am intrigued by just trying to push the boundaries and find things that are unique to an artist rather than trying to replicate something. Um, I'm really into the journey of trying to figure out what that thing is. And it's not about trying to find the next thing, like consciously. It's like, I like the organic process of it. I, I don't think you can force things like that. Um, a, a huge bucket list would be to like 
work on a track with Sheryl Crow, obviously, because I would be a full circle True. moment for 10 year old <laughs> me that attended her concert as like my first concert ever. That was another light bulb moment, actually. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just want to keep making records and I want to start making records even in other places around the world and just be inspired by different spaces and, and different people. I mean, you, you've you already sort of, re- like in the U.S., I was reading about the Disney production that you did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Children's music. Tell me yeah. about that a little bit, actually. Children's music is a lot of fun, actually. Um, I got into it, but like most things, by accident. Like a friend of mine <laughs> reached out to my friend Tim Thorny, my late friend Tim Thorny, who's, he was an incredible human being. And he's like, you know, I think you should really get into writing in television, and ads and I was like sure I'm open to that um and so he connected me with a uh post like music production house that that specialized in children's programming and I mean the cool thing about doing something like that and why it was a really good fit for me is because in that world you need to output something really quickly you need to be able to write and you need to be able to fully produce and finish like a mixed track to deliver to the the series like very quickly and so because i i can write and i had the production um skills and i thrive and i love film obviously i'm a film filmy i went to film school um i loved that it was a space that i could combine all of those passions into one space and also i got to like play all the instruments on everything and it's really fun so yeah anyway i got into writing for some uh television series and then that opened up like a huge new world for me and then people started to approach me to to pitch on other series and so that's how the the disney one came up it it was for a show called dino ranch and uh yeah again a friend of mine had referred me for that project and we got in touch with the production company and we had actually already done another theme song for that production company um i wrote both songs with serena Ryder, and the first show was a show called Remy and Boo and they actually approached us initially cause they wanted, um, it was a show about two best friends and they wanted best friends to write the song. So Serena and I are best friends and we're like, okay, let's write a song about like how much we love hanging out with each other and how much we love each other. And so, yeah, so that's like where that thing happened. And then they really were happy with what we did for that. So then they're like, okay, we'd love it if you're like available to just pitch on this new series. It's about, a bunch of get like this family that's running a ranch but the the catch is that they're dinosaurs they're it's a dinosaur ranch and I was like I freaking love dinosaurs and I loved the concept of the show it was like so beautiful so we just took a stab at it and that was another song we didn't overthink it we wrote it and I kid you not 15 minutes and yeah and then they're like wow this is awesome and that's what I love about the kids world is that you're you're not writing for grownups that have like all these specific ideas and perceptions of things. You're, you're almost having to put yourself in the shoes or what you, what you remember of being a kid, right? Where, and I, so I try to come from that place of curiosity when I approach the kids stuff. And it's not about trying to think about what kids like. It's about, I think following your intuition. Usually my first idea is like the one that ends up landing Um, and not getting in the way of it, not judging it, not overthinking it from my perspective as a grown up with all these experiences. I like to approach it from a place of curiosity and wonder and imagination. And like, you realize that kids are just, they think everything's cool because they're experiencing everything. And they're like, wow, everything (laughs) is awesome. You know? And I, I also love how you casually just dropped that. Like, yeah, Serena Ryder's my best friend now. And from the beginning of this podcast <laughs> and knowing how you guys connected, it's okay. You're best friends now. Well, Got it. <laughs> well, no, we connected. Actually, I met Serena on my 14th birthday. She was playing a oh, show okay. at Spaha, like on the University of Toronto campus. And from that moment, we just became friends. And like, it was instant. And we've been friends since. And yeah like it's so we've had some amazing experiences together you know like I got to tour with her and her band we write songs together work a lot in the studio and we just like to hang out and just be humans together too which is yeah. really fun so one thing I, I wanted to make sure I didn't forget about too so you you got to play in the house band for the launch with CTV it's kind of like a weird question but like was that hard for you with so many other people being in charge of how things go 
it's not hard for me to do things like that because I think that in the business that we're in, you know, that in order for things to um, work as a quote unquote well-doiled machine, like you're there to do the job that you're hired to do. And for me, I'm very used to being able to switch between being a session player to being a songwriter, to being a producer, to being an artist. I, I mean, I've done all those things. So I know that each of those things have their place and a protocol that follows that place. Right. So, so that was easy for me. I don't care what I'm doing. I just want to be doing things with awesome people. And I don't care if I'm not the one in charge. The biggest struggle for me in that space, to be honest, was again, my imposter complex, because especially when it comes to the live stuff, I have been playing live forever, but it's the scariest thing for me still. I still get still. so anxious that I want to throw up all over the place every time I have to <laughs> oh play God. live. So for me, and, and because it's live, and it's, well, in this case, it's to tape, but you're still playing live. There are no like, oh, you screwed up, so you have we can get that shot again. Start like, over, yeah. Yeah, and I'm playing for these artists that are auditioning to have this huge opportunity. So for me, I'm like, holy crap, what if I screw up like what is going to happen and so right. those types of experiences for me because I'm so terrified of messing something up like I'm always on the edge of my seat when I'm playing for myself I don't care like I'll, whatever yeah but when it's for <laughs> somebody else like the pressure is on for me and I just can't relax through that I can't necessarily enjoy it until I ease my way into it and then after I'm like okay I got through a few things and I haven't totally messed this up then I can relax um Gotcha. But yeah, it was so scary for me at first because I I also don't consider myself to be a house band type of person. Like any person that I would go on tour with was a friend of mine that was like, hey, you play all these instruments. Do you want to come out on the road with me? And I'm like, yeah, well, hells, let's do it. It's going to be so much fun. So I've never right. thought of myself as a session player. So when I got that call, I'm like, are you sure you want me? Like, I don't shred. I don't jam. <laughs> I come rehearsed. Like, I like to come and rehearse knowing what I'm doing. I am right. very scared of spontaneity in that regard because I just don't feel as comfortable playing that way. Wow. Yeah. So interesting how like, <laughs> you know, how you just adapt to the different environments though. Trying to. Because then uh, there is there is that little FOMO voice in my head that's like, if I pass this opportunity up, like what will I miss? And I think that's the motivator. <laughs> Every door opens another door too, right? And that's been the case. That's why like my resume is so weird. So going to your your resume or your bio, there's this little piece. Uh, I'm going to read this to you, and I want to watch the um, expression <laughs> on your face here. In May of 2022, Hill made Canadian music history when she became the first woman to be nominated for and win a Juno Award for Recording Engineer of the Year in the 46 years since the category was created. How did that make you feel? I still don't believe it. Um, it's still so crazy to me. Um, but... I feel very proud and um, grateful at the same time. But yeah, it's still a bit shocking to me. Those projects, it was so, when you submit for that category, you can choose up to two songs. So I chose a song that I worked on um, for an artist named Sate, who's an incredible rock and roll goddess. And yeah. um, Tanya Joy, who's this really prolific singer-songwriter. And what was really special about those projects for me is that they were recorded during the pandemic. Like with Sate's album, we had actually finished that album a few years before, but then we decided to go back to the studio during the pandemic because she still hadn't released it. And she's like, you know what? I think I want to like reapproach some things on this, on this oh, record yeah. from the perspective that I'm in now that happened during the pandemic when like everything was at a standstill. And then with Tanya, I actually didn't meet her in person until a day before the Junos. Like, so we, <laughs> we met online at like this thing that I was mentoring on. Um, and I had heard this one song of hers and I, it was like one of those demo listening things. So it was just, you provide feedback. And for me, because I was there coming from the perspective of a producer, I was like hearing this song and all these like arrangement ideas and production ideas started coming to my head. So Based on that, she reached out and she's like, hey, do you want to like work on some music with me? I'm like, sure, but we're in a pandemic. So we literally just like went back and forth, tag team this thing until oh her project was done. Um, so for me, I think what was so special about those things is that, A, that people resonated with those records because th the challenge is 
in doing something like this during a pandemic is that you're not in the space with somebody. So you've eliminated that initial visceral thing of having a certain energy in a room and you're trying to find that remotely, which, Mm -hmm. um, which we ended up doing because I believe that even before you start pressing record on something, you need to, you need to forge a relationship and build a trust and a bond with the people that you're working with, because you're not going to get anything real. If you haven't established the foundation, people aren't going to take risks and open up and be vulnerable in front of you if they don't feel safe doing that. Um, so we really took the time to do that and we managed to overcome the hurdle that was not being able to be together to make these things. And the fact that people then connected to them as much as we did while we were making them, I think meant so much more to me. It, it really seemed like you were in a tailspin. Like when you won, you were like, oh my God, <laughs> what's happening I was no, right To now? be completely <laughs> honest with you, I was not expecting it. Like I was against these freaking legends. Well, I shouldn't say against, but it's like, you know, I was against some of these amazing, up against these amazing peers of mine. And I was just like, again, imposter syndrome. You can't believe that you possibly can be in that space. Um, so for me, I felt like that 12-year-old kid that's like, what am I doing here? Um, it's like, oh, I belong here now. Yeah, it, it was kind of one of those moments where, because I, you know, especially when you're on the behind the scenes side of things in the studio, like you don't get out much. You really don't have any perspective. You're just kind of, working on your thing you're just doing your thing so Mm -hmm. I don't really have any perspective of any perceptions around me or like what's happening um so I think it that it was a bit of a pinch me moment like that's why I think I was feeling so overwhelmed and just in shock about it what what do you like better being behind the scenes or or in front um I think both I knew you were gonna say both you can't pick (laughs) I well for me personally like I really do enjoy the solitude and like the introverted nature of me being in a room in the dark and just like making sounds and being weird Lego, um, that, Lego. Le- exactly like there is a part of me that feels very comfortable doing that as I said I don't feel comfortable being out there but there is also this part of me that does get an enjoyment out of it so I do miss being out on the road um at times, but I do really, truly feel that this is where I'm supposed to be. Like, this is the one space where I think I've been able to reconcile all the random things that I do and apply them in one place. And on top of that, I get to help people find their voice and find their sound. And that is extremely fulfilling to me. So the artist side of me um, that just enjoys being creative and making records, I still feel fulfilled in producing for other people because it's just as much my record as it is theirs I'm just not trying to impose my will on it but I do get the same satisfaction and feeling and it does feel just as much my baby um, in that capacity so that side of me is fulfilled I get to play on things I get to play multiple instruments I get to record I get to facilitate things and it's just the space where I feel at home finally where nothing's missing you know well, huge congrats for all the things. And, <laughs> and and honestly, I just love how like there's so many things that you love. I often um, find myself trying to pick, right? Like, oh, should I be over here on this creative side of things or should I be over here like trying to lead a team? And you can do multiple things at once. I think you could do everything. And what I've observed is that there are certain currents at certain points in time where you're meant to be in certain places. And I think if you're open enough to be able to see those windows of opportunity as they come up, sometimes you have a little deviation, you know, from the path that you foresaw, but it's that experience that will kind of like, I never thought I would be a hired gun multi-instrumentalist touring with people on the road. That was never my idea when I started. Um, But in doing that and in taking those opportunities for me, it just opened up this whole other world. It, it developed this skill set that I wouldn't have developed if I didn't do that, you know? So I like to see all of these things as skills that you develop that you can then kind of curate and narrow down into the place that you're meant to be. And for that moment, and sometimes that might change, right? Like, and that's okay. I think just being open to the, because I think ultimately we're here to experience things. Like there is, yes, there are professional goals, but there are also human goals. And I think that when those two things can reconcile and 
you know, be complementary to each other, then that's when the fun begins. And it's not always fun, but like for the most part, if you love what you're doing, it's fun. The last segment of the podcast is uh, bringing in some, some other females who you think have incredible stories to tell and who you admire in the industry. So who would you like to nominate to come on the Women in Media podcast? Okay, this is hard. Um, so Sate, this artist that I work with, um, I mean, she's not just an artist. She is an actor. She is a writer. She is so many things. She is like this full-fledged, multidimensional, like interplanetary being. Um, and I think she is a genius. I think that she is one of the most incredible performers I've ever seen and, and met. Um, prolific artist, a visionary, someone that's ahead of their time. Um, and that is why I would nominate them. Um, also, my dear friend Tamara Pademski comes to mind, who is an actor, writer, musician, true renaissance woman. Um, she would be incredible to talk to and share her experiences. She actually was recently um, in the Amazon series Outer Range, which I just finished, and my mind is, like, blown. I cannot oh, wait I for the second season to come. Yeah, no, you have to check it out. It's so incredible. She's a sister, right? Yes. Jennifer yes. is another person I would suggest, too. Jennifer <laughs> it does everything as well. Another really dear friend of mine, Annie Bradley, who actually took me under her wing when I was younger, um, and she mentored me. She's a director, producer, writer. She used to let me shadow her on music video shoots, and she directed one of my music videos for like my solo project. Um, but now she's working as a director in television and writer in television. Cool. She's just overall badass. Well, thank you so much. I know you're, you're skipping town, so thanks for fitting this in before you get out of town. And I, I just can't even wait to see what you do next. Like, I, And it's hard to tell what next will be. I have no idea either. That's the, the beauty of it. It's also scary. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me. In the episode notes, you can find out more about Hill Krakutis. And please join me for my next episode in two weeks when we'll kick off hockey season with Carolyn Cameron of Sportsnet. Hi, I'm Mercedes Nickel, four-time Winter Olympian and host of Dropping In, a podcast with Mercedes. This is a podcast where I interview a bunch of different people. I get the good, the bad, and the ugly, as well as I share my stories along the way. Now you can drop in at droppingin.com or subscribe on Apple, Spotify, and YouTube. I'll see you soon. Another Sound Off Media Company podcast.